Okay, so we are going to be doing four questions. Uh, there are some problems I didn't get to do in the exam review. Um, so we're going to do four questions. Uh, and I actually want to highlight what kind of questions these are. Um, this first question we're doing is a hypergeometric question, but it doesn't involve any probability. And it's kind of a curveball. A lot of people freaked out when they saw this, but it's actually really simple. Uh, just people freaked out because it wasn't in the usual format of finding a probability as many of the other questions you encounter are. Uh, number, three, number three from spring... Uh, so from summer midterm two part one it's a binomial question that's the one about the um different strategies for ceos hiring somebody or something like that uh and then these next two uh here and here are p-bar questions that i didn't like i said didn't get to cover in the exam review so i'm going to record a video for those here <coughs> okay so let's go ahead and get started on um spring 2020 midterm two question four i put midterm two in all of these just because People sometimes will open midterm one and like, I can't find the question. Well, don't open midterm one, midterm two is the what you're looking for. Okay, this is a hypergeometric question because we've got 30 people and then um, there are 12 of a certain type and 18 of another. So we've got 30 people. I usually draw that triangle, or tr not triangle, but tree. As you remember, as a, this is something like I did from exam one where I said, this is the counting problem, right? Where I broke people up into two groups. If you remember, I would do you know, like, there were 12 movies, um, seven of them were action, four of them were comedy, and then two, uh, one of them was a drama or something like that, or yeah, something like that, right? Um, this is very similar, that we have 30 people, 12 are men, 18 are women, and then we're gonna draw from that, 50, uh, from that 30 people, 10 of them. So if, we're, if there was some sort of probability question, we would start by saying our denominator is 30 choose 20, or 30 choose 10, because we have 30 people overall, and we're drawing 10 of them to form a committee. But Here's the thing. We're not going to be asked any sort of probability question for this problem. We don't even need a denominator. All this is saying is, first off, so like I said, this is hypergeometric. The question wants to know, if the committee were chosen randomly, what is the probability that six or more of the committee are men? Well, that means you're going to find the probability that X equals what values? Well, we want to find the probability that X is either how many? Well, starting as low as how low, right? We're trying to find the probability. Let's actually type this out. They want to know the probability that at least six men, right? Because it said six or more. Let's, just, let's say six or more men, that's AKA uh, at least six men. Well, what probabilities would I have to add up in order to get the probability that at least six are men? I would need to have had up how many men or what probability of how many men? Six or seven or eight or nine or 10. Exactly, six or seven or eight or nine or 10. Um, and I would add up all these probabilities and I would get my answer. I'm not being asked to find that though. And a lot of people, this is where a lot of people freaked out. They weren't being asked to find this probability. They were just asked to express this as a summation. Now, some of you, most of you, I would think have already taken Calc 2 where you probably messed around with summation. So this summation notation, this is not the first time you guys have seen summation notation. I know that. Um, so this, all this is asking is what values of X um, would you sum over, sum the probability function over? Well, as you said, <clears throat> it looks to be six through 10. And so with that, mind, with that in mind, we're looking for answer choice B. We want to find the, pro the sum of the probabilities from X equals six up to X equals 10. That's it. Cool. Now it gets a little bit trickier because the next part says, what's the probability? Uh, now, now, we're, now we're saying a committee of 15. This time committee of 15 is formed. And I still want probability of at least six men. So once again, we'll start with P of six and add P of seven. But the, the trick here is that we're not gonna go all the way to 15 as we did when we went all the way to 10. And why was that? Why did we go up to P of 10? And why won't we go up to P of 15 when I tackle this question? Well, uh, how many men are there total? There's a reminder to look up back at the tree. How many men are there total? Oh, 12. 12. So we're not gonna go all the way back up to, we're not gonna go all the way up to, to my text editor's being glitchy. P of 10, P of 11. We're not gonna go all the way up to 15, because there aren't even 15 men. There aren't even 13 men. There are only 12 men. Um, it's not possible for us to add a P of 13. And this is what she's trying to get people, she's trying to trick people into picking this answer. See answer choice B? It looks very similar to answer choice B from the previous part because we just went from six up to 10 because that's how many people we were selecting to be in the committee. So a lot of people for this question picked B, not remembering that, oh wait, there's only, um, there's only, I don't know why my color didn't change. There we go. There's only 12 men. So it's not possible to get 13 or 14 or 15 men. And for that reason, the answer is D. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, cool. And there's one more here. It says we're doing a committee of 25 men. 
This one's even trickier. Um, committee of 25 is formed. And the question is, well, again, what's the probability of at least six men? You might be tempted to start at P of six again, but it's actually not possible. I think this is, uh, this is I believe that this isn't possible. If I do six men, let, let's say six men are chosen. Because six men are chosen, how many women must then be chosen because we're forming a committee of, of 25 people? If six, are, if six of them are already men and I'm forming a committee of 25 people, how many women must then be on the committee? Uh, 19. But do we even have 19 women? No, we have 18. Right, so P of six isn't even possible. This is a trick that most people overlooked. They figured, oh, at least six, I'm just gonna start at six. But if the, same, if the committee we're forming is large enough, and we need to we need to fill it with as many people as we can. If we only if we fill it with as few as six men, we have to fill it with then 19 women. But 19 women isn't a possibility. After all, we only had 18 women. So this pro first probability isn't possible. I'm going to go ahead and write out what we kind of had before. We're going to say plus p of seven plus p of eight. I'm going to use dot 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 because it's going to get tedious to write every single probability. I don't know why I didn't do that earlier. Up to p of 11 plus p of 12. And again. For the same reason I couldn't have 13 from the last part, I can't have 13 for this part. There are only 12 men. So I can't select, I can't say plus P of 13, expecting there to be 13 men. It's not possible, there's only 12 men. Um, but this probability, this P of six is also null and void. We can't use this guy because again, if there are, and I'll just write this out, just write this out in words. This is impossible. P of six is not possible because there would necessarily be 19 women. If there are six men, there have to be 19 women on a committee of, of 25, but we only have 18 women. So 19 women is not possible. We would cut out this P of six. P of seven is fine because if there are seven men, how many women are there? Uh, 18. 18, that's fine. We do have 18 women. So P of seven is a possibility. So this would range from seven up to 12. And that would be answer choice F. Does that all make sense? Yes. I think this question is easy because did I, have, did I have to calculate any probabilities? Did I have to use any sort of 30 choose 10 or 12 choose four or 18 choose nine or anything like that? No. No. And so, but a lot of people freaked out all of a sudden like this is nothing like what she's ever done. And it's true, I, I all admit, this is nothing like anything she's ever done. I've never seen her write a question quite like this before, um, but I didn't have to find any probabilities. All I was asking for is what are the different cases of probabilities for all these different committees? And what's possible given that I have 12 men a two women, and sometimes I'm, I'm forming a committee of 10 people, sometimes I'm forming a committee of 15 people, and sometimes I'm forming a committee of 25 people. Good on that? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> that question's out of the way. I'm going to go over to um, stat, uh, summer 2020, question three. This is another binomial. This, so the last one was hypergeometric, although we didn't do any probability for it. This one is a binomial distribution question. I'm just going to skim through real fast and see if we can find the values of N and P. I know it, I didn't explicitly say, doesn't explicitly say that it's a binomial distribution, but how did I know it's a binomial distribution? Uh, we've got 16 businesses that we're going to try and submit a proposal to, and the probability that any given business will hire our firm is 0.8. So that's basically straight up binomial. They're telling me we've got 16 trials, and the probability that any one of those trials is a success for us is P equals 0.8. And then we get a few questions about the expected value, finding the probability that some of these things occur. So the first three are pretty easy. Expected number, expected value, or the, the average number of contracts we would get from some of these proposals, just from the cheat sheet, use the cheat sheet on the attached study guide. Um, fourth column, I think it's binomial, so it's the first row. Yeah. Uh, and that would be N times P. So in our case, it's just 16 times 0.8 which would be, what would that be? I think 12.8. 12 .8. Yeah. Okay. They don't ask for the variance, but they could have. Variance of X would be N times P times one minus P. That would be 16 times 0. 0.8 times 0. 0.2, which would be 3.2. Yeah, I think so. Uh, nope. Yes. No. 2.56. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, they didn't ask for variance, but I just was getting it anyway. And make sure that if they ask you for the standard deviation, you know to take the square root of that. Okay. Um, number two, what's the probability that X equals 16? We get all contracts, so get all contracts. That would just be the probability of X equals 16, right? We can use the binomial probability formula for that, or what would you use instead if you don't want to use the binomial probability formula? Hmm, I don't know. I would use the formula. Oh, okay, because I was going to say, I think I might have gone over this in uh, a quiz session. Maybe you weren't there for that one, but um, there's a function on your calculator that can get it pretty quickly. Do you know that function? 
Oh yeah, Binome PDF. Mm -hmm. Binome PDF will do this pretty easily for us. Um, you would say trials. I think the order, if you don't have the uh, fancier T I D four and it's old, I think the order you put this in is the X or the the trials first, then the P value or the probability value, then the number the X value that we want, which is happens to be sixteen. Um, or if it comes up on your if it comes up on your T I D four in such a way that it just says trials, well you'd say sixteen, uh, and then then they give you they ask you what P is, you'd say 0 0.8. And they say x value, and you would say 16 here. Um, of course, you can use the formula. So I'll write the formula because I know that you said you would have used the formula, but you also could have used binomial PDF. But if you want to use the formula, it would be 16. Choose 16. How many contracts are there total, right? I'll, ask, I'll prompt you for these questions. So how many contracts are there total? 16. How many of them do we want? All of them. All of them. So 16 times what's the probability of getting a contract? 0. 0.8. And again, how many contracts do we want? 16. Uh, we'd follow this up technically by saying, what's the, what's the probability of not getting a contract? So if it's 0.8 to get a contract, it's 0.2 to not get a contract. And how many times do we not want to get a contract? Well, if we got all the contracts, that means there were none that we didn't get. Okay. Good. Uh, number three is very similar. They want the probability of getting uh, 15 of these contracts. So I would just do, if you wanted to, probability x equals 15. That would be binome PDF of 16, 16 trials, 0.8 is p, and the x value is 15, or once more, you could use the formula. Um, six, there are 16 contracts. We want 15 this time. The probability of getting one contract is 0.8, and we want 15 contracts, but we need to miss out on one of those contracts, so we need 0.2 to the one because this represents the contract we did not get. Uh, I want to mention that there were no problems in this section where she says find the probability of getting at least 15. So I could have asked, let's say this is like question 3.5. Uh, what's the probability of getting at least, uh, let's say at least two contracts? Oh, I just clicked off, dang it. Probability of at least two contracts. Well, that would be uh, a really long drawn out process. I would have to do P of two plus P of three plus P of four plus P of five, all the way up to P of 16. I don't wanna do binome PDF uh, what, what, what will end up being 15 times and then add that all up. What we can do instead is use a trick. What's that trick? P of one minus, or just one minus P of one. Yep, and also you're forgetting one other possibility for us. Oh, P of zero. Right, right. so we just find the two probabilities, binome PDF of one, binome PDF of zero, subtract that from one, and that will leave us with every probability from two to 16. Cool? Yep. Okay, they didn't ask that though, but just in case they do ask some sort of what's the probability at least, just know we have to combine those probabilities. Okay. Uh, the Next part is where things get a little tricky. So it comes down to uh, this strategy where we can ha we can we have we have enough stuff to handle up to 14 contracts. And the revenue we for each contract is get $700 for each contract. Uh, your costs are 3,500, so it's like a fixed cost. So let's, in fact, this is kind of reminiscent of the kind of um, variable transformation problem that we did for exam one. Let's con let's create a variable called R for revenue. Uh, that is dependent on the number of contracts that we get. Uh, and we'll say that's 700 times X, but then minus 3,500. <laughs> now, the, the he thing here is that X is a little tricky. In fact, I'm trying to think of it off the top of my head right now. Um, if we submit 14 proposals, the, the value of N changes. So strategy one, I think is saying, change N to 14 rather than 16. With that in mind, uh, we need to figure out what the expected profit is with strategy one. So expected profit or expected revenue, or I guess this is profit because I've subtracted the cost of 3,500, but I hesitate to use the, four, I, had, I hesitate to use letter P because what, what do we tend to use letter P for? Probability. Right, so I'll say profit. I'll say the word profit out like that, or you can use R for revenue if you'd like. Um, so expected value of profit will be expected value of 700X minus 3,500. We can break this up into 700 times E of X minus 3,500. That's just using a formula from my cheat sheet. That tells you how to break up E of AX plus B. Um, and now we have to find the expected value of X. Well, the new expected value of X is now different because we're not, like I said, we're submitting only 14 contracts, not, thir not 16. So our expected value of X changes. It's no longer um, 16 times 0 0.8, which was uh, the point, or was the 12.8 we got before, but now we're submitting 14 contracts, which means, I actually don't know what this number is off the top of my head. Do you happen to know it? 11.2. 11.2, great. So that is the number that goes in for E of X up here. Uh, sure, we'll just draw an arrow. 
And if we do that, we get expected value of profit equals 700 times, let's make this a little longer, 11.2 minus 3,500. I didn't bother getting that one either. Um, let me get a calculator out. 700 times 11.2 minus 3,500. Comes out to be 4340, is that right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, you, have to, you have to keep me honest here. Um, okay, strategy two is a bit different. Strategy two says, well, we're gonna submit all 16 proposals. Screw it, we're just gonna submit them all. Um, um, go back to, we're using n equals 16 now, again, um, but because we only had, we only had enough staff to handle up to 14 contracts, if we get 15 contracts or 16 contracts, we have to throw those extra contracts to subcontractors. And here's the deal. We're gonna be paying them uh, at a loss, right? We only get $700 in revenue, but it costs us 1500 to give it to a subcontractor. So um, we pay $1,500 per contract that goes to a subcontractor, okay? Yeah. So what's our expected profit this time? Um, we've got a, this is a little tricky. Uh, I think we're still gonna do 700 times E of X minus 3,500. Uh, and this time E of X is 12.8 now because we're using that in equals 16. Mm -hmm. We're gonna plug that in, but we're, we won't be out of the woods. We're, we'll, we'll have, we will have been forgetting something. Namely, we will have been forgetting the fact that sometimes we're gonna be paying out some money to um, subcontractors. And th then those subcontractors are associated with certain probabilities. It just so happens that those probabilities were probabilities that we calculated back in questions one and two, which I never actually bothered calculating. Um, do you actually happen to have the prob probabilities of getting, like, do you have that binome PDF? I'll talk, actually, I probably could just do well, for I now. Think, I think you skipped five, maybe. Did I? Yeah, because you're, you're calculating profit, right? Five is the expected amount to pay, and then six is profit. You're right. Okay, I was getting ahead of myself, but you're right. So let's, yeah, was, this would probably be number six. Mm -hmm. So I got way ahead of myself. Uh, five just says, what's the expected amount you'll pay to some contractors? Well, what are the possible, let's, I, uh, I'm glad you caught me because this is an important part. Um, we're going to create a table. What are the possible amounts we spend? Well, I'll say C for costs. What are the possible costs that we pay out of subcontractors? Well, if we get any, anywhere from zero to 14 contracts, how much do we have to pay to a subcontractor? Zero. Zero. Um, if we end up with 15 contracts, how much do we have to pay to subcontractors? Uh, 1,500. Right, because we only have one subcontractor, so that only means 100, or 1,500 out of our pocket. Or if we get all the contracts, we have to pay two subcontractors, so that comes out as a cost to us of $3,000 because it's 1,500 times two. The probabilities of C, the probabilities associated with doling out these costs are actually values that we found earlier when we found that this was the, these were the answers. I'm gonna type, type this and actually fill out the values what these are. This was the answer to two. And this guy over here is the answer to one. At least the probabilities that we get here. I'm gonna use Wolfram Alpha because I think it can do binome PDF. Of, I think 1500 was the answer to three. This is 15 contracts. What was one then? Oh, you're right, yes. One was the really easy, just expected. This is three, and then this is two then, right? Mm -hmm. Good catch. Keeping me honest, thank you. Uh, so this, I think 16, and then can I do 0. 0.8 comma 16? Does this even work? It does indeed. So probably x equals 16 is 0. 0.028. We'll leave it at that. And then I can change this to 15. And this is 0. 0.0. One one two six. I will just get point one one three. What's this probability? Well, this is the probability that we get zero contracts or one contract or three con two contracts, all the way up to fourteen contracts. I don't want to have to calculate that, but I know that some of all these values must be one. So if I just do one minus minus point one one three minus point oh two eight, I get point eight five nine. But now that I have this, and I just want I want you to find the expected costs. Okay, that's pretty easy. I'm just going to do my usual zero times this, 1500 times this, and 3000 times this, which would be, obviously I can skip the zero times 0 0.859, 1500 times 0 0.113 plus 3000 times 0 0.028 gives me 253.5. So expected cost ends up 253.5. Cool. That was on her answer key as well, but 0.3, but that's just because of rounding error. Oh uh, yeah, I'm sure that, yeah, I might've rounded these a little bit 
so much that right because these are these numbers are big this is 1500 this is 3000 so it's making the it's making the smaller decimals carry over a little bit higher but yeah that, that's probably close enough um probably around to more decimal places than i'm doing when when you do this um and you'll be fine and then now we are answering question six which wants us to find what is the profit uh well that's just your i think does she not give you a hint she doesn't really um i think we can just do this number and then minus the 253.5 that we just found in part five. Yeah. That makes sense. This was a really tough one, honestly. Um, let me get a number for that. 1,200 times 12.8 minus 3,500. Those are our fixed costs, but then also minus the 253.5, which is this two, five, what was it? Five, two, was this an answer? Five, two, oh, six, Zero, six point seven. Cool, great. All right, because if this is, would have been a 0.3 if I had rounded, mm -hmm. then this would have been a 0.7. Yep, this would have been a three. Believe me, that's a three, it's not a five. It was never a five. Um, okay, cool, yeah, that's, and what the interesting thing is that she's trying to say to you, one thing to take away here is that if we if we played it safe and only submitted 14 contracts uh, and didn't bother sending out 16 contracts, we'd only uh, get 40, 43, 40 in profit. Whereas if we do send 16 contracts and in the off chance we end up getting more contracts than 14 and we have to pay our subcontractors, we actually net on average about a thousand more dollars, 900 more dollars than the 4340 if we had used strategy one. This is where, I mean, she didn't say it. She's kind of implicitly saying it, but question seven could have been, which strategy as a business would you want to use? And on first glance, you might think, oh, it doesn't make sense to send out 16 proposals if we're going to get dinged $1,500 every time we go over the limit of 14. But the thing is, uh, there's not a, it's, it's not always 100% chance that we get a contract, right? There's an 80% chance we get a contract. So sometimes, sometimes we're going to shoot, you know, shoot our shot on across a spread of 16 different, um, what are these, contracts, um, proposals, whatever, and hope that we get 14. If we overshoot and get 15 or 16, it's not a, it's not a bad thing. We'll have to pay our some contractors. But on average, this is going to net us more money on the long run than just sending out 14 contracts. Is that good? I will admit that four, problems five and six are relatively difficult because it kind of went on this. Where did my tools go? Oh, here they are. It kind of had us use a little marginal distribution table or a little, uh, I guess it's not a marginal distribution. It, well, it depends. Uh, it's just some probability distribution where we had to find the expected value. And it's kind of out of the blue, right? We're not, we're not really usually doing this sort of thing for a binomial distribution. So this is kind of out of place. Um, but it was, it was easy all the same once you know where to go. And that's the hardest part of this test is knowing which direction to go. Good? Yes. Would you say that this is also like a linear combination within a binomial problem? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, you know, what I call a variable transformation or inside, inside tucked inside a, um, a binomial distribution problem. And actually, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, that is like this question down at the bottom down here where you'll see this during the exam review. Um, thought this is the spaceship question. This was one of the hardest questions from this exam. Uh, so if you get to the Mars trip, the, the spaceship question, the Poisson probability question, it's really, really hard. Everyone freaked out and just bombed this question. Yeah. There's a lot to, lot to read. I mean, there's a whole slide dedicated to just explaining what the problem is. Um, actually two slides, right? There's this intro and then there's this whole slide. Um, but the under, it's, I do. A, I think I do an okay job explaining what the hell's going on in this problem in the exam review. So you'll get you'll, you'll see it for a second. But to your to your point, yes, it's it, this is yet another problem where they ask you some probability questions and then they tuck a um, a linear combination or a variable variable transformation problem. Not, I guess it's not a variable transformation problem because it's just use this table here. Uh, I don't think you have to create a variable transformation, but you do need to. Uh, there aren't any costs or anything. There's about like three. Uh, you just make a table with all the possible costs or I guess values of the equipment that can get to Mars, right? You can get 3 million makes it to Mars or 1.5 million makes it to Mars or 1 million makes it to Mars or zero makes it to Mars based on what ship you're talking about and how many storms come, but you'll see that during the exam review. Okay, with that in mind, I wanna start doing some P-bar questions. I know I didn't get to it in the exam review, so I wanna do two of them right now. And those P-bar questions are kind of short. There's only usually two parts, right? There's here, this is, um, this is spring 2019 only two parts. And this is summer 2019. Again, only two parts. Uh, what do I need for this problem? I think you need the following formulas. I'm going to go write these out. Um, I want to make sure I do this right. I don't want to give you something you don't need. You said the first one is spring 2019? Yes, spring 2019, number six. Uh, the formulas you're going to use are P, I say P hat, but I'm going to use her notation P bar over P 
or minus p over square root of, this should give you a p hat. Uh, is it known or unknown? It's p times one minus p over n. Yeah, see, it's either, it's sometimes p, but it's sometimes p bar, so we have to be a little careful. We might find out that it's p bar in, this, in the future, but we'll leave it for now. Um, Cause sometimes, so this is one z score. There's another z score that changes these to p bars. And so we have to be wary of that. But I guess for now, maybe she hasn't taught you that version yet. Okay, medical researchers are especially interested in survivors of a concentration of antibodies in excess of 10. Um, your researchers have a random access, a uh, random sample rather of a 400 survivors. We're gonna write that down. That's just telling you N is 400. Mm -hmm. The probability that any one survivor has a concentration of antibodies in excess of 10 is P. Um, she says, you calculated P in the previous question, use your answer to part A of the previous question as P. I don't know what that was. Um, I think I well, so this is spring 2019, number six. We can also just make up a number. But if you have that value off the top of your head, that'd be great. It's annoying to note that you can't do question six unless you have successfully done question five, which it is continued. To be fair, it is continued, and it's only worth 20 points. But did you happen to find that value of P? Actually, let's just do this. It's probably just a quick normal CDF. Do you have your TI-84 on you? Yeah, so normal CDF. Yep. This will be the one and only one time I will tell you to change mu and sigma from zero and one to nine and two. We want 10 as our lower bound. A million right. as our upper bound, or just like one followed by a bunch of zeros. Um, your mean mu will be nine and your standard deviation will be two. Like I said, this will be the one and only one time I will allow you to change mu from zero and one, or sigma to zero, mu is zero and sigma is one. Change those to nine and two respectively. But w when you go back and do problems, make sure you change this back to zero and one. What okay. did you get, what'd you get for that P? Uh, where do you want me to round to? Uh, three decimal places is fine. Okay, 3.309. 3.09? Yep. Cool. Okay, make sure you go back and change mu and sigma to zero and one. All right. Okay. Now we have our P, which is saying use this as our answer. So basically she's saying, here's N, here's P. Um, now, write down the exact probability that at least 140 of the 400 survivors have a concentration of antibodies in excess of 10. Let's talk some vocabulary. P bar, is the sample proportion. Um, in our P, just plain old P, is the true proportion. And then N is our sample size. Okay. Here we have 400 people. We have our true proportion as calculated based on the answer to the previous problem in part five as 0 0.309, right? And then what is the sample proportion here? Well, that's given by the fact that we drew a sample of how many people? 400. And how many of them uh, had antibodies in excess of 10? 0.309 of them? Mm -mm. Let's read, or actually, sorry, we don't have that. We're trying to find the probability that how many have antibodies in excess of 10. So for part A, we want to find the probability that how many have Oh, at least 140, so right. yeah. This is p hat or p bar, okay? So this would be 70 over 200. This would be 0.35, I think, yeah. 70, 0.35, cool? Yep. So p bar comes from the sample. It's based on how many people we want to have those antibodies. Uh, and in this particular question, they said, write down the expression for the probability that at least 140 uh, out of the 400, so that's 140 out of 400. That's saying that we want p bar to be 0.35. Well, now I have all the values I need to calculate this z score. I have p bar, I have p, I have um, n, and so I'm ready to go on that. Let's go ahead and do z it, equals. It, um, that because there is at least 140, we have to do you know like 140, 141, 142, or is that just implied in the question? It is implied by the z score. I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, let's talk about this. What we're going to do is we're going to do a normal CDF. Right, we're basically what we're saying is here, we're going to fit this distribution to a bell curve. Um, and then the Z score that corresponds to this 0.35, I don't know what the Z score is, but this, this Z score will correspond to P, equal, P hat or P bar equals 0.35. And it says, we want the probability that it, how many, not just 140, but- At least 140. And guess what we're gonna do? Oh, uh, okay. Find the upper tail. When we find the upper tail, we are effectively finding 140 and above. Does that make sense? Cool. So P bar questions will always be related to the normal distribution? Absolutely. I mean, what's giving that away? The fact that I'm finding a what? Z-score. Yeah. And whenever you're finding a Z-score, you're using the normal distribution, right? Yes. 
cool. This is just a different z-score. Like the z-score you're familiar with is x minus mu over sigma, right? Or sometimes sigma over square root of n if we're talking about a sample of n objects, right? But this time, we're not talking about means. We're talking about portions. We're going to get more into mean and proportions as we get ready for the final, but that's, that's a, a week from now or more than a week from now. Um, I mean, getting ready for the finals more than a week from now. Not to scare anybody in the, who's listening to this video that the final is not a week from now. I'm saying getting ready for the final starts probably a week from now. Okay, so people are figuring out like, oh my God, the final's been a week? No, no. No. Yeah. Okay, um, so we're just going to, I was saying, we're not talking about X, we're talking about this Z-score now. It's still a Z-score, we're still going to use the normal distribution. Let's plug in all the values we know. P is 0 0.309. We're going to use over square root of 0 0.309. One minus 0 0.309 would be 0.6. 691 mm -hmm. and then over 400. I definitely need a calculator for that, but you can always use this as a calculator. 0.35 minus 0 0.309 over square root of 0 0.309 times 0 0.691 over 400. I get 1.775. Is that good? 1.775. Yep. Cool. That's a z score. And then, and I want the probability of this z score being bigger than 1.775 or less than 1.775? Well, they said, what is it that tells me I should do is use a greater than rather than a less than? At least so everything right. about it. Right. And now it just reduces itself to a regular old normal CDF question. You're going to go on to your calculator. I'm not going to write this out with my cursor. Let's type this out. We're going to do normal CDF. Uh, lower bound is 1.775. Upper bound is 100. And of course, you don't need to, you can leave this as, as is because we're going to leave our mu as zero and sigma equals one. Mm -hmm. Good, what do we get for that answer? 0 0.03794, but I guess it would be 0 0.38, yeah. 0 0.038. Yeah, sure, yep, perfect, um, excellent. And then part B says calculate the probability that at, I have the probability that at least 35% of will get the means criteria users approximately. Oh, we did, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I think A is just this. Yeah, do not evaluate your answer for A. And then this is your answer to B. That's it. So this is A. This is B. Cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. Or is she saying, I see what she's saying for part A. I think for part A, she's saying, I want you to write. Oh, maybe sigma? Yes, I think that's exactly, that's exactly what she wanted. So the so we're so let me let me break. I'm gonna spend a few minutes on technicalities here. Um, the normal this is not normally distributed. It's it's not. It's a it's a binomial distribution, right? Because how many people? How many trials are there? Four hundred. And there's a probability associated with each person having a number of antibodies larger than ten, right? That um, in fact, the, you see the letters that you usually see associated with the, normal, the binomial distribution. What are the two letters that are usually associated with the binomial? P and N. P and N, right? So what she doesn't, this is not A. She wants you to write it as a binomial distribution. So you're going to write, how, what would I write for, this, this is insanely hard, but it's worth doing, I guess. We have 400, choose um, 140, times 0.309 to the power of 140. Yep. And that means that if 140 do have this criteria, meet this criteria, that means uh, 200. Yeah, 0 0.691, good. And then how many of them um, don't have the that number of antibodies? That'd be 260, right? Yeah. Now this would be the probability of how many having that certain level of antibodies. Not not at least 140, but exactly 140, right? Yep. So now I have to do 141, 142. Right. Now that's going to take a long time to write, right? So you could you could probably get away with saying saying plus dot 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 plus, and then using 400, choose 400, 0.309 to the 400, 0.691 to the zero, right? That's to signify that this dot, dot, dot is going to signify every possible value of the number of people that can have this number of antibodies from 140 up to 400. Or what we can do instead is rather than using that, we can use summation notation. We'll be a little clever here. We're going to delete this and this and this. We are instead going to use summation notation. This is probably what she, ex she had expected for, um, this, was th this is 2019, so this is pre-COVID. You're writing your answer in a blue book. So we're going to say n equals 140 up to, we're going to go to 400 here. This will be n, this will be n, and this will be 400 minus n, right? Because if there are n people that test, have, satisfy this criteria, having more than 10 antibodies, that means 400 minus n of them don't. 
And so this is an equivalent expression she would have seen, wanted to have seen written for part A. Now, some of you are out there wondering, oh my God, I would never have known to do this. Sure, I'm sure you're probably thinking that. Um, you could have at least done the one I did before where you had written, instead of summation notation, use the 140, put the 140, put the 260, and then said plus dot, 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 write the same exact expression, but then replace 140 with 400, 400, and zero. And that would have been conveyed by the plus dot, dot, dot. But second of all, it's hard to know how this kind of question would be asked on an, on an exam you're taking online. So I imagine she would give answer choices that are written in summation notation or an answer choice where they're written with a plus dot, dot, dot. Now, I think she probably expects you to know summation notation. And as we saw, there were questions where she does expect you to know summation notation. So I would expect an answer looks like this. Part, this is not the most important part, by the way. I think the most important part is B, where we end up using this formula. And by the way, if you haven't written down this formula yet, you need to now. Um, it probably is on a cheat sheet of hers or formula sheet she gives you or whatever, but it's important that you start writing that down because you're gonna be using it for that P bar question. Um, is that the formula specific to the Bernoulli random variables? Um, or yeah, is it so it's Bernoulli slash binomial. Um, we'll get into a distinction between Bernoulli and binomial. Actually, you will understand this because I just told you yesterday that the, and people can tune me out for the next 10 seconds, but the geometric distribution is a special case of the negative binomial distribution, which you aren't tested on. But in the same way, the uh, Bernoulli distribution is a special case of the binomial distribution where n equals one. Okay, gotcha. So, but but for the PR questions, we will always use like this formula if we're given, you uh -huh. know. Right. The most important part to take away from this is you're, now you can, for if you're listening, if you're watching this video at home, now tune me back in because you can ignore like I just what, what I just said the last 20 seconds about the negative binomial distribution. You're not tested on that. Um, the most important part about this, the most important takeaway is that you're going to be expected to convert some probability statement about um, some binomial distribution over to a normal distribution question. And this is using what's called the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem, or which is abbreviated CLT, um, allows us to convert a binomial distribution probability problem to a normal distribution probability problem. And that's provided that the sample size is large enough. Now, what, what counts as large enough? We'll say for now that 400 is definitely big enough, okay? She might've told you in class what the sample size needs to be or some sort of threshold that N needs to be in order for us to use that central limit theorem. But for now, we're not gonna worry about what that threshold is. I'm gonna tell you now that it, 400 is certainly big enough. The number is usually around 30 or 40, but, uh, and I guess for the binomial distribution, it's some needs to satisfy the success failure condition, but that's not, not too important. What's most important is using this formula to get to this, this z-score and then to this probability. That's it. And we're gonna do it one more time because I said, I, I know that this is probably very fresh. You didn't really have any quiz questions on it. So I wanna do another. So here we have number 10. In a close election, proportion P voters support the green candidate and one minus P support the purple candidate. You work for the green candidate. You take a random sample of 500 voters. So we have N equals 500. Real quick, which yeah. exam is this? This is summer 2019. P is 0.53, and this is question 10. So once more, it looks like a binomial distribution question um, where they give you N and they give you P. It, by the way, it would be very odd for you to see a binomial question this late in the, in the, in the, in the test. Uh, this is because, where is my tab from group me? That's not the one here. I sent out, we sent out an email earlier, exam review. Um, Let's just, yeah, the binomial distribution question happens a lot earlier. Uh, that's not, what, oh yeah, that's, this is what I wanna show you. This, this guy. The binomial distribution question happens a bit earlier. Uh, it's usually question two or three or four. So with that in mind, um, wrong tab. Uh, question three or four, to see it this late at question 10, I would probably say, uh, this is probably not a binomial question. And we're also seeing P, um, so we might be thinking that it's a P bar question. You wouldn't really expect to see a binomial distribution question this late on an exam. It's, so it's probably something about the normal distribution or how the central limit theorem relates to this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. If P equals 0 0.3, what's well, probably that in the sample, more than half support the green candidate. Use an answer using the central limit theorem. So um, what's our P bar gonna be? Well, we want to find the probability that how many support the green candidate? More than? Half, so half. 251 or more. 
Yeah, but let's use a p bar, right? That the, remember that the formula that, we're, that we use for the p bar question is z equals p bar minus p over root p one minus p over n. Um, and if you if you say two fifty or two fifty one, that's not going to fly because what, where does that number go? Remember the numbers you're really looking for are n, which is given straight up, p, which is given straight up, and then p bar, and that is where we're using that 250, or well, I guess you shouldn't say 250, but rather that if 250 out of 500, that would be P bar is how much? 0 0.5. 0 0.5, that's what you should be harping on. Um, okay, so we're gonna plug all these things into this guy, get a Z score. We're gonna do 0 0.5 minus 0 0.53, oh, I have that, I have that right, 0.53 divided by square root of 0.53 times 0.47 divided by 500. I get negative 1.344. And I want to find the probability that at least or is more than that, right? So you can think of it as a bell curve. We found negative 1.344. And I want more than half, so I want to shade this way. See the paint tool Ink right there. So I want to shade everything to the right. Uh, this will be a, a normal CDF. Um, negative 1.344 is our lower bound. 100 is our upper bound. Leave mean and leave mu and sigma as zero and one. And what do we get when you do that? Did you already crank that out? Yeah, point nine one one. Cool, perfect. Um, why does this answer make sense at least in terms of, of it makes sense in terms of a few things. Look at the shading. It's obviously it's obviously more than how much of the graph. Way more than half. More than like, half. So I would expect it to be. If you get an answer like suppose you did normal CDF uh, and suppose you got point four one three four one three or something you should freak out at this point because obviously we've shaded more than half the graph, but if the calculator gave me um, 0.413, I know I screwed something up, right? Take, do, do little small sanity checks like that. Um, because after all, how, how could I get less than half if the shading shows me I should get more than half, right? So right. 0.911 was our answer here. And another thing is al already it's the case that what percent of people are already supporting the green candidate? Uh, 0.53. So basically we have a jelly bean, we have a, we have a jar full of jelly beans, 500 jelly beans. 50, we expect 53% of those jelly beans to be uh, green and 47% of those to be purple. We pull 500 out of a jar. We would probably expect more than half of them to be green, right? And yeah. the high, high likelihood. Now, there are some times we reach into that jar of jelly beans and pull out 500 uh, jelly beans. And sometimes we get more than 250 purple. That's fine. That will sometimes happen. In fact, it happens about 9% of the time, right? Because if if we get more more green jelly beans than purple, that happens how how often? 0 0.91, 91% of the time, right? But then that means more purple jelly beans than green happens 0.099% of the time, or 9.9% .9 of the time. Cool? Yeah. All right. Um, part B is tricky. Uh, you're going to hear me say in the exam review that the phrase, how large a sample, usually means you need to find N, right? Uh, and that's what I'm going to say here. We see how large a random sample, the moment I hear this or see this, this is really important if you're listening, the moment I see how large a random sample should be taken, uh, that's a, they're, all they're asking is, what is n? That's it, okay? So whenever you see this, alarm bell should go off and say, oh, they just want me to find n. All right. Well, we found the moment ago that the probability of this up here was 0.911, right? Mm -hmm. Now we want it to be how much? 0.99. 0.99. So I'm going to undo a bit and say, I need to find some z-score here. Let's make my bell curve look a little bit nicer, a little bit cleaner. It's getting a little sloppy there. It's, it's still pretty sloppy. I don't, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. That's we're going to, I'm going to tolerate that. Okay. I'm going to tolerate that sloppy bell curve. Okay. Point. Oh, we want this area here, all this and all this. We want this area to be 0.99. Previously, it was 0 0.911, right? That was our answer to A. But now the question is, and by the way, this was when we used N equals what sample size? 500. 500. But now the question is, what should, what should N be so that this area is now 0 0.99? With the same P and P bar? Exactly, with the same P and P bar. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Because after all, if you didn't have N, right? We don't have N anymore, right? Mm -hmm. How could I then solve this problem if I don't have P or P bar? I have two unknowns and there's no other, no other way to get those unknowns. So we're still at the same P and P bar. We, we don't have the same N. What about Z? How do we get that though? Well, this is where 
our calculator functions come in. We know that if there's 0.99 here, that's the wrong color blue I want. How about this guy this is better. If there's 0.99 here, how much must be here? 0 0.01. 0 0.01. And what function will tell us the z-score that corresponds to 0 0.01 to the left of this z-score? In norm. Mm -hmm. Inverse norm. So we're going to do inverse norm of 0.01. I'm going to guess, because I think I know my calculator function off the top of my head, negative 2.32. Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Well, if you round, it's 3.3. Okay. I'm sure. Okay, I'm just messing with you. Okay, negative <laughs> 2.33. Good. That's telling. Now we, uh, you made an excellent point that this time, this time, we want we don't know the value of n. This is an unknown. And you said you asked using the same value of p and p bar. Absolutely. We still have this. We still have this. We have now found this. So we have all the values that we need in the z-score formula. We're just going to take this guy, plug it in here. Take this guy, plug it in here, and here, and here. It's basically plug all the numbers we know into that formula and solve for n. Now that's a tricky part because um, the algebra can get a little messy, and I know how awesome yeah. every student in Eco, Eco 309, 329 is just brilliant algebraists. I know you guys are fantastic arithmetic. Um, am I dripping with sarcasm? Yep. Uh, 0.53 goes here, 0.47 goes here, but it's okay, I will walk you through it. One cool trick we can use here is a little bit of breaking up the square root. So what we're going to do is we'll say 0.5 minus 0.53 over square root of, I'm just going to find this number, 0.53 times 0.47 is 0.2491. And then we'll say over root n. See what I've done here is I've split the square root in half? Yeah. That's something you're allowed to do, provided that the only thing going on inside the square root is multiplication and division, which is, which is the case. Um, furthermore, what can I do with the, I have a, basically a two fraction of a complex fraction. We have a fraction inside a fraction. When that happens, you can flip the bottom fraction, assuming, assuming the fraction bar is like this, the long fraction bar here and a small fraction bar here. Um, we can flip this bottom fraction in such a way that the root n moves to the top. So now this is going to read, and by the way, 0.5 minus 0.53, that's negative 0.03. We have negative 0.03 times square root of n over square root of 0.2491 equals negative 2.33. At this point, uh, solving for n should be relatively easy. I'm going to take the negative 2.33, multiply by square root of 0.2491. Can you actually give me what the it was 2.3 what? 2 something. 2.3 2, uh, 2. 2. 6. 6. 3. That's yeah. fine. I think 6 is good. 3 decimal. I usually go to successful places, so it made me a little nervous with going to 2 there. Uh, negative 2 points, 3, 2, 6 times square root of 0. 0.2491. I then need to divide that by negative 0. 0.03, and I'll have, uh, let's copy that number. I'll have root n equals uh, um, this guy. One last step we need to do is do what to both sides of this equation. I'll get my hands on n, square both sides. So I'll do 38.6968. Take this up to a little more decimal places than you would have because small, small values here can make large differences when you square it. And I get 1497. Now, there's a problem with that. What's wrong with 1497.4423? Oh, n has to be an integer. Mm -hmm. It has to be a whole number. What whole number will we choose? Now, everyone's very tempted to think, oh, we'll just use 1497 because that's the closest value, right? But when you're doing sort of, when you're doing a how large a random sample or what is a what is in question, you always have to round up. So rather than 1497 point, rather than round down to 1497, even though it is closer, we'll round up to 1498. And that is the answer to this problem. Yep. Cool. Any questions on anything I've done so far? Nope, that's pretty clear. I just did my algebra a little bit differently, I think. That's fine. There's probably more than one way to do this. You can, if you want to move this whole entire radical over, you can. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Like you might say 2.33 times the giant square root of what ends up being 2.491 over right. n. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I did. That, yeah. That's totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. Of course, you end up moving the root n back over, but that's okay. Um, if you, there's more than one way to skin this cat. Just make sure you're being very, very careful with this arithmetic. Cool. Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to stop the recording and I'll see you guys later. Good luck on the exam.